African Americans in Galveston, Texas, were really among the last to know freedom had come. The poet in me thinks about the scene of General Gordon Granger reading to them his General Order 3, that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. I think that it's really important that we focus on that day on African-American, not just achievement, but also resistance. And you see that right now in the uprisings around the country. Uh, and I think it's taken on a particular poignance this year. The Emancipation Proclamation had gone into effect January 1st, 1863. This Union General was making his announcement on June 19th, 1865. And so in a way, Juneteenth also admits to a delayed freedom, that it took too long for us to be free. Hey everyone, I'm Tremaine Lee. We are in the midst of a great reckoning on race in America, but in many ways, it's a reckoning on America itself, of what this country has been in the past, what it is today, and what it could one day be. As we grapple with these big fundamental questions, we're left to interrogate virtues we assume to be true, that at its core, America is a land of freedom, but freedom has never been free, especially for the descendants of enslaved Africans who toiled in bondage for centuries. It took struggle and bloodshed over many years. On this Juneteenth, Black Independence Day, a commemoration of freedom for those once held in slavery, we ask the question, are we truly free yet? This is Can You Hear Us Now? Juneteenth, a discussion about justice, equality, and the meaning of freedom. It's been 155 years since all black Americans finally learned of their emancipation from slavery. Yet some say the struggle for true freedom continues. After the deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and Rayshard Brooks, millions flooded the streets all over the world, demanding justice, equity, and freedom. I spoke with a few of the foot soldiers in that fight to find out what they believe true freedom really means. From Minneapolis to Paris, from London to Atlanta, from New York City to Washington, D.C. This is what democracy looks like. The call for equality, justice, and freedom. Freedom. It's what 93-year-old Opal Lee has been fighting for most of her life. A group of people in the neighborhood where my parents had just bought a house didn't want us there, and they burned the place down. It happened on the 19th of June. That date, June 19th, or as some call it, Juneteenth, Black Independence Day. It's the day in 1865 when a Union Army general arrived in Galveston, Texas, with the news that the Civil War was over and enslaved people were free. It was two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Lee is campaigning to make Juneteenth a national holiday. Each year, she walks two and a half miles, symbolizing the time it took for all black people to get their freedom. Do you ever get tired of just having to push and having to fight? No, gee whiz. No, I'm not one of those people who are sitting in a rocking chair thinking the Lord's gonna come get me. He gonna have to catch me. If we can just understand that we all bleed red blood and that we simply need to get past this thing of color. But for over 400 years, color has been used to divide Americans. Anti-blackness is the organizing principle of white supremacy in the United States. We are the gold standard of those who've been oppressed based on the racial caste system that racial slavery, a genocide, settler colonialism set up in this country. Dr. Peniel Joseph is a leading expert on race and history. Do we have a fully realized freedom in America? No, we don't. We've had racial progress. If you're viewed as a citizen by law enforcement, if you're viewed as a citizen by your fellow neighbors, they don't marginalize you, they don't dehumanize you, they don't incarcerate you, they don't kill you. So that's why we say Black Lives Matter. And for America's younger generation, justice and true freedom still seems elusive. As a black person, um, freedom doesn't mean anything until um, black liberation is achieved. Kerrigan Williams and Jacqueline LeBain co-founded Freedom Fighters DC in the midst of the George Floyd protest. They plan to make this Juneteenth a call to action. How important do you think it is uh, for, for black folks and white folks to come together in this moment? It can't just be black people fighting for black people. It needs to be all people fighting for black people. And Opal Lee is glad to see a new generation 
rising. I'm delighted with what the young people are doing. I'm not wishing I was younger, but hey, I'd like to be out there in the middle of it. With me now is Dr. Peniel Joseph, founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Tiffany Crutcher is the twin sister of Terrence Crutcher, who was shot and killed by a police officer in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2016, and is now the founder of the Terrence Crutcher Foundation. Anna Devere Smith is an actor and playwright, and author, retired Army captain and CEO of Robin Hood, Wes Moore. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, Dr. Joseph, I want to go back to this notion of freedom. Uh, black folks have certainly fought for it, but what is true freedom in this American context? Have we achieved it? And if not, why not? Well, we have yet to achieve true freedom. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. struggled his whole life for radical black citizenship, and Malcolm X talked of radical black dignity. And King defined citizenship as not just the absence of racial oppression and racial segregation. He defined citizenship as the appearance of health care, decent housing, um, and really a guaranteed income. And that's what the Poor People's Campaign was about. So to achieve citizenship, we have to not only get rid of thousands of racist policies and transform uh, systemic racism in this country, we have to actually have the appearance of anti-racist and racial justice policies. And for black people, that means very simple things. It means the ability to accumulate wealth, to have income, to have housing, uh, to have health care, and really to have safety and security, and not in the way we think about the criminal justice system, which has incarcerated and punished and demonized black people, but safety and security to have investment in communities, to have mental and physical wellness for our children, um, to have uh, uh, access for our LGBTQ communities, to say that black women's lives matter, that black trans women's lives matter. So it really means both the end of racial oppression, but the appearance of institutions that are both anti-racist and are promoting racial justice in every facet of their being. Wes, Dr. Joseph talked about Malcolm X there, and I want to talk to you about uh, the idea of racial progress. Malcolm X once said that stabbing someone in the back and pulling the knife out two inches isn't actually progress. Progress is removing the knife and then beginning the healing process. Where are we in terms of that process? And, and metaphorically speaking, is the knife still in the back of black America? The, the, the knife is absolutely still in, in the back of black America. I mean, think about it, where, where according to the Federal Reserve right now, a black family possesses a net worth of, of just shy of $18,000 compared to a net worth of $171,000 for a white family. So in other words, one white family has the net worth of 10 black families. And that's not just be, that's not because these families worked harder. That's because of histories and structures and systemic racism that has been placed into all the frames of within our large society. Race is one of the most predictable, uh, one of the greatest predictors of outcomes in, across several areas within our society. And that is life expectancy, academic, uh, ac academic achievements, income, wealth, uh, maternal mortality. And so if we're not willing to acknowledge the history of why these disparities exist, then there's no way that we can actually begin to attack them with any real degree of sincerity. And so, yes, progress, you know, when we talk about progress, progress can also only be made if we're willing to acknowledge the history of why the progress has been so backwards and reverse in the way that these systems have been built. Anna West talks about uh, those economic disparities, and in so many ways, that's also been violent, right? The violent economic uh, dislocation of folks. But when it comes to actual violence, Anna, this week marks five years since the Emanuel Church massacre, and we're on the heels of a string of deadly police shooting. What role has police, vigilante, and white supremacist violence played in limiting black freedom? Huge, huge not just in terms of lives lost, but also it's a spiritual assault. I have friends who are accomplished uh, black individuals who are afraid to go out for a run. And of course, the massacre in, um, the massacre in, in Charleston, we'll never forget it. So I think all of these things, the grief that's caused, the anxiety that's caused, 
in addition to the blood that is shed. Uh, sadly, many of us uh, watched the video of your brother being killed by a police officer. And you are among countless black people who've had a family member killed by police violence. And I want to ask you, when the state kills, what do we lose collectively? Obviously, you lost your brother, but all of us, have we all lost something when that happens? Uh, absolutely, and thank you so much, Jermaine. Um, all I can say is that we're in a state of emergency as it relates to being black in America. Um, the past few weeks, they've been tumultuous, they've been triggering, um, and, and of course, they've brought back memories of, of what happened to my twin here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And today, we're, everyone from all over the country is touching down on Tulsa, Oklahoma to commemorate uh, Juneteenth, and not only Juneteenth, but to continue the protest of George Floyd, Am Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and, and of course, my twin brother right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, but you can't really talk about what's happening today in Tulsa, Oklahoma, without reflecting back on what happened almost 100 years ago uh, during the Tulsa race massacre. Um, the same police culture, that same state violence that burnt down Black Wall Street is the same state violence that killed my twin brother and that's killing black and brown people uh, in America today. And, and so uh, we all should be concerned. When we think about the systems that bind us and you think about whether it's access to health care, whether it's criminal justice and police violence, um, you know, black folks are trying to move through these systems. And one of those systems that we've been grappling with for a very long time is the political system, the elect electoral system. And we're in a, an election year, one with really high stakes. And there's already concern about voter suppression efforts. And I want to ask each of you, can we vote our way to freedom? Wes, let's start with you. The, the answer of uh, can we vote ourselves to, to freedom is we have to, because we have to understand how much voting matters and how much laws matter. You know, I, I think about the amount of progress, that the progress we have been able to make is because that we've been able to push a value system that eventually our laws were able to keep up with. You know, where, where, where as Dr. King once said, you know, uh, that, that laws, laws won't, won't change the heart, but they will protect me from the heart. And so who we put in these offices and what we permit to be done on our behalf as taxpayers, it does matter. And so as we're thinking about this election, to know that there is not a single bit of philanthropy or, 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 or corporate social responsibility, that is going to be enough to be able to not only undo the level of inequity that's happened, but also to actively push us towards an anti-racist agenda that can actually give our communities and our people real opportunities of growth. That is something that has to be done in, co in concert with elected officials who are sitting in these seats and supposed to be advocating on our behalf. Anna, what, what's your take on that? Obviously, there, folks have made it harder to vote. There are many hurdles. You think about voter ID laws. You think about the long lines. Uh, black folks facing this election, is this a hurdle that black folks can get over? And is this a way towards freedom? Well, I mean, let's go back to the notion of not knowing that you were free, that the information that you were free was denied you, right? So, as again, we think about Juneteenth. So, I would say that we have, we know about this throughout history, and that uh, activists, all of us, should assemble what's happened before to think about how we can disrupt it, actively disrupt it. Dr. Joseph? What do, you, what do you think? You know, historically speaking, it's been tough, um, and their voter suppression efforts have been keeping folks back. Is this a way? I think we have to vote, and everybody should register to vote and, you know, vote like our lives depend on it in November, because they do. But I also think it's about more than the vote. The transformation that we're seeing now is about black people alongside of Latinx, Native American, Asian, indigenous, and white allies really taking to the streets. We have to remember, democracy is in the streets. What Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the greatness of America lied in the right to protest for right. Too often, those of us who have access think that those who don't should vote, and we wonder why they do not. Citizenship is more than the vote. Citizenship is health care, it's child care, it's black kids not having um, disproportionate rates of asthma, it's black women not having um, negative outcomes uh, in terms of maternal outcomes and lower 
lower uh, baby weight than their white counterparts, irrespective of income. So we have to organize on the ground. We have to um, love each other. We have to convince uh, different institutions locally to have deep empathy for black lives. And when we think about the Black Lives Matter movement and the policy agenda of a movement for black lives, they talked about policies that were not just dependent on the voting, but depending on all of us reimagining American democracy and making racial justice the beating heart of American democracy. So yes to voting, but we need to transform uh, food deserts. We need to end racial segregation in our public schools and in our, in our neighborhoods. And we need to have guaranteed income and health care and housing for all black communities in the United States. So we don't have just archipelagos of prosperity in the black community and vast searing racial wildernesses of disadvantage and police brutality and incarceration and premature death of black communities. So voting is a part of this, but until we educate and feed and house and clothe um, and employ every single member of that community, they're not going to use the voting rights that have been suppressed since 2013. So voting is only the tip of the spear. So when we think about the political sword and the political shield, voting is our shield, but that sword is organizing, educating, and agitating, and we're seeing it on the streets of America and globally. The only reason why corporations are saying Black Lives Matter is we have forced them to say that Black Lives Matter because we have democracy in the streets, and we've done what Dr. King tried to do in 1968, a poor people's campaign that was the first Occupy Washington movement that said nonviolent civil disobedience was going to be a political sword to transform American democracy, even when Americans didn't want that democracy to be transformed for black people. Tiffany, thank you very much. Dr. Joseph, Wes, and Anna, stay with me. Coming up, we're on the ground in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the city that was home to Black Wall Street in the early 20th century for a Juneteenth celebration. Plus, we're talking health and wealth in the black community. Stay with us. Juneteenth is another kind of Independence Day with a celebration of freedom, food and family, uh, especially food. And I think that that quality is still there very much with us. You know, it wasn't the Emancipation Proclamation necessarily that freed people. It was our efforts over the years to run away, to resist. It was black people's own wills that set them free. They formed abolitionist groups, insurrections. They fought for their freedom. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.